Hi, I'm Bethany Hughes. Uh, I'm a historian, author and broadcaster and I'm here at the Beyond Borders Scotland Festival with... Amanda Tao. I'm a news columnist for the New York Times where I'm one of the writers of the interpreter column. And um, we've just met in the garden and so we're going to have a chat. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. And we were saying what should we you know, be talking about and we were both fascinated by stories and facts and the role of women in both through time. Yes. So we thought we might kind of focus... On that. Yeah, which I think is a, I think is a great idea because it's something that I know both of us have engaged with sort of from different ends of time, basically. Yes. yes. Um, but it's so important, and I know you know from my work as a journalist, we really rely on the work of historians and social scientists to have given us a basis of information to draw on and kind of narratives to draw on about how the world works, and I find very very often that those are narratives not just shaped by men, but about men. Um, mm. And women have been left out because their lives weren't considered part of public life. Um, and so I wonder, as a historian yourself, is that something that you have found yourself grappling actively with? Or? Yes, it is. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't my mission. Mm -hmm. So I didn't set out to think I need to rewrite women back into the story of history. But as a historian, I noticed that women had been consistently written out mm -hmm. and a historian's job is to fill those gaps. So that felt like a very obvious gap to try mm -hmm. to fill. Mm -hmm. um, and a really fascinating one as well, because if you look right back to very early periods so exactly as you said you know I go way back in time so I sort of go beyond to the classical to the archaic bronze age and then back back into prehistory um, and it seems really cogent to me that women there is some sort of equity between women and men right at the beginning of the story of civilization so women are very very uh, definitely there um, in the DNA of civilization mm -hmm. but it's almost then something changes and then the stem cell of culture mm -hmm. then there's an adaptation and, and women are written out and I there are all kinds of theories as to why this happens um, but if you look at uh, the figurines that are made of, of, the hu of humans of mm -hmm. human form between around 70,000 BC and around about 5,000 BCE, 95% of those that we have, that we've discovered, are of women. Hmm. So there's so people are imagining what it is to be human and they're imagining female form as they do it. So, so interesting. We don't know what that means, but right. that means something. Right. Right. And, and it, that doesn't talk to me of women being pushed to the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And what point in history is it that it seems to have that shift where women do seem to be getting you know what you described as the stem cell mutation yeah, when is yeah, that yeah i think i think it's around about three thousand three and a half thousand years ago and there was a really different there's an absolute quantum shift so up until then let's just kind of be very clear there isn't a matriarchy there isn't this kind of you know romantic age of mother goddesses mm -hmm. and you know um, a total equality and that 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 is a fantasy there weren't even goddesses, you know, that, that early on. But there is definitely equity. So you see women being able to um, speak in council. They are landowners. Um, uh, they're allowed to bequeath land, which, which tells us they pay tax, which shows that they have disposable income. In really broad um, brushstroke terms, I think what happens is that civilization gets greedy. So around about three and a half thousand years ago, you have these... Uh, beautiful cogent Bronze Age civilizations, and what and people start to look over the hill. So they go, okay, we've got uh, enough food in our granary stores. Um, we've got uh, a standing army. We've got beautiful culture. Uh, we have poets. We can communicate and trade with those on other lands. We're good. But wouldn't it be great if we had that citadel over there too? Mm. And in order to take that citadel, you need muscle. So you need a standing army. And at that point, what you see in the development of religion is that's when you start to get these notions of smiting male gods mm. um, who very quickly become the head of a pantheon. So you have male gods who are in some way militaristic, who are in charge. And it happens over about sort of 150, 200 years. It's a really, really, really short short period of time and the corollary of that in society is that's when you start to see more restrictions being put on women and they're not given to access to certain religious spaces uh, they suddenly seem to be owning land less so I think what it is is that whereas up until then every recognized that in order for a society to work both women and men needed to be a, a, a functioning part of it 
suddenly what women become are child bearers and that is the role that they have in society rather than being there in, in, in a much more ingrained way and the, the kind of the valour and the kudos and the theatrical power is very evidently with a male army mm. so I mean that is I'm sort of collapsing a, you know a nuanced detailed history yeah, yeah. into into a kind of one and a half minute um, answer but but uh, y the, the patterns are very definitely there in the archaeology but this is completely fascinating to me because I you know I worked on women's rights as a lawyer. I write about gender issues very often as a journalist. I read social science and, you know, legal history and things like that. And I have never heard about this. This is something uh. that is, it's not just that I wasn't taught it in school. It's that I never had any idea to even go looking for it. Mm. Um, and the thing that's amazing to me about that is that, you know, you spoke about the, um, you know, the, the, sort of imaginary matriarchy where everything is equal and everyone is happy and that is the only version I've ever heard presented of mm. you know what if there weren't a patriarchy and people just say like oh you know yeah. um, and I'm reminded of the, even the conversations around Game of Thrones which is obviously fictional <laughs> yeah. um, and when uh, whenever there would be sort of uh, outbreaks of rage over the portrayal of women in it and people would say well you know you just have to be realistic but it's a show that includes dragons and yeah, zombies yeah. and things like that yeah but i think that speaks to how much our inf our imaginations have been shaped yes. by our knowledge of history and the narratives that it creates um and the even the idea that we would have to invent something completely new to have a yes. society where men and women are equal and Yes. Um, well, it's so, I mean, it's so... That's why, I mean, with kind of contemporary issues, when people say this is so hard and why is it taking so long, and I always think, well, it's because we've got a lot of catching up to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a lot of millennia's worth right. of just kind of quiet, sustained, systematic prejudice. Right. And it's there in all of our language, so the fact that, you know, the word virtue, its root is veer, which means man, this mm -hmm. idea that in order not just to be strong, but to be good and to be an effective citizen, you have to have maleness. So we're kind of programmed I think that's yeah. that's the thing so it's very hard to know where to where to look and do you think I'm really interested to ask you do you think because those are I think they're relevant facts mm -hmm. but do you think that some people might think that those are just facts from a very very long time ago that have no kind of relevance to the to the discourse now or they're just they're just a sort of interesting in a kind of bespoke vase on a mantelpiece kind of way rather than so I'm having... sure I, first of all I think they're very relevant mm -mm. and I'm sure there would be people who would want to dismiss them as not relevant but I think that's because there are a lot of people who are very invested in concluding that our current power dynamic in society the hierarchies and the political systems and everything are some sort of law of physics that you know there's a natural order to things and you can tell because you can look at history um, and that anyone who is trying to cause a significant change to that is trying to do something unnatural um, and it's something that as a journalist I hear very often even from people who are ostensibly aligned with progressive causes it's the sort of you know you have a conversation with somebody and they have all sorts of interesting ideas and then you get to the butt and there's a turn and you reach the point where they sort of encountered the, the limits of their imagination of how mm. different society could be and the, the point at which they're invested in believing that some things have to make have to stay the same mm. so I think it's actually quite threatening in some ways mm. Mm. to encounter the idea of things being genuinely different and it actually working um, and I can see why, because it, I, when you were saying women owned land and property and we're paying taxes, that's something that in a lot of parts of the United States, a married woman <laughs> yeah. didn't own her property or pay taxes in her name until like the 70s. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's right. It's a classic thing that my mum remembers that she had to get her husband, she wasn't actually married, so her husband's signature to buy a fridge, you know, that she wasn't yeah. allowed to buy a fridge right. without a man's right. say so. So um, it seems it's incredibly recent history, yeah. all of that. Um, yeah. And so I think we we forget how kind of fundamental those kinds of issues are to the ordering of a society. Mm. Um, and I think it can be incredibly helpful actually to have a historian like yourself actually look at them and actually say, you know, we have these records, 
there's no reason why anyone would have made them up. There no. were no feminists N- back then, no, I would exactly. assume. No, exactly. No, um, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so they, they definitely aren't made up. And also, possibly even more interestingly, through time, other civilizations engage with these issues. And we sort of think of this as being modern questions that we're mm-hmm. asking. But if you look at democratic Athens and at the work of um, Plato, possibly these are the ideas of Socrates through, through kind of the, the pen, as it were, of Plato... And there's, he says, Plato says, you know, if... And it's a sort of hypothetical uh, kind of academic debate, but, you know, he says, surely women have to have some role in society because if society is only ever run by 50% of itself, it can only ever be half of what it can be. Mm -hmm. So isn't that interesting that they're addressing that? You know, and this was... It was... Athenian uh, uh, Athens in the, the democratic period was not a kind of you <laughs> yeah, know bed of roses for, for, for women at all. Well, it, well, yeah. Although you see, although again, it's not in the. I mean, it's terrible actually. You know, and uh, it, kind of in the official versions, we we hear about the r- repression of women there. And you know, one of the kind of favourite poets of the dark times, a guy called Simonides of Amorgos, who writes this hideous, hideous long poem talking about how to control women and how, you know, women are born from sows and pigs and dogs and this is what makes them so slutty and disgusting and uh, bitchy, literally bitchy and the best thing a man can do is smash out the teeth of his wife with a stone so that she stops yapping and it's like, and then you hear that someone does was the guy, you know, everybody would quote Simonides the whole time. So it was not in any way a feminist wonderland. But two things are interesting. I think one is that they are debating these, the role of women, and you see that in the philosophies, you see that in the tragedies and the plays as well. The fact that in Antigone, you know, this young teenage girl is given a voice, mm-hmm. and we're, we're exploring through her what it was to be a, be a teenage girl on the wrong side of the law, on, on the wrong side of custom at that time. Um, and then later in the fourth century, there's a, a great author called Queen of Smyrna and he does this whole epic about the Amazons he, he, it's, it's actually sort of a version of the Iliad the Trojan War but he talks about the Amazons and one of the Amazon queens Amazonian queens has this incredible speech which is basically the origin of the Shylock speech in Merchant of Venice where she says "Do we, if you prick and we prick us don't we bleed don't we breathe the same air as men mm-hmm. doesn't the same sun uh, smile on our on our skins in the same way. If so, why are we denied what men have? And that's a man writing that, putting right. that into the mouth right. of a woman. So that they they are obviously they are asking themselves those questions um, too. So I think I think we also have to look. But nobody knows about that passage, mm-hmm. you know. So right. it's also what passages right. have been elevated as being. Yeah classical literature that we should all hear right, about right. Um, and that's sort of you know shoved under yeah. the carpet so that brings me to um, my next question which I'm very curious about which is I know you've done some more contemporary work as well um, mm. including travel and speaking to people working on peacemaking I think mm-hmm. um, and I wonder um, how your sort of historical background has made you aware of how things like that are shaping the historical record of today and whose yes. stories get told and memorialized. Well, that you, that's that's a very um, pertinent question. So you, you are absolutely right. It's through being a historian, and you are exactly the same as a as a journalist and, and writer and reporter, that you know if you aren't hearing about something or you half hear about something, that's the reason to go and find what the rest of the, mm-hmm. of the story is rather than to think, I don't understand this or or it can't be true because I'm only hearing a kind of, you know, fraction of it. So, um, so I'd, I'd heard about the uh, these really extraordinary schemes on the Syrian border, in Jordan and Lebanon, and Jordan where um, women, female refugees, were being retrained as heritage stonemasons, which is a very traditional male mm-hmm. uh, craft, as mm-hmm. you can imagine. These women had nothing. Some had come with their families. Some had some their families had died. Some had come on their own. But they were being taught how to rebuild those extraordinary, beautiful buildings in mm. Syria that have been destroyed. Mm. So, you know, in Aleppo, of all 40 historical buildings, yeah. we think all of those have been destroyed beyond repair. So they are going to have to be built again. And I was really interested in that for so many reasons. One, it was just cool that mm-hmm. these women yeah. were, were, were doing that. Um, also the fact that uh, they talk about it, this giving them hope rather than despair because they're creating something rather than watching things being destroyed but it also made there was a sort of historical um, imperative to, to and compulsion really to go because 
the story of humanity has been a story of conflict. And in conflict, people have often chosen to use their hands to make things, I'm sure, as some fo a form of therapy, as well mm -hmm. as just needing to do it. And craftsmen talk about being able to lose themselves in their craft and when they're building you know, beautiful public or religious or private buildings through history, that this is at their salvation. So I thought that's really... So there's something really amazing about that. These buildings are being targeted and destroyed in order to break people's mm. sense of themselves. And then these women are going and learning how to rebuild them so that they can right. go back. Right. And that shifts who they are in contemporary society as well. So yeah. I think it's the... I mean, you're, you're the same. You're just... You're showing an interest in people, mm. whether they're alive or dead or wherever they <laughs> are. You know, that's... I think, you know, that's what... Clearly I haven't been showing enough interest in people who lived 16,000 years ago. <laughs> no, no. But you will I now. I need to get a book or something now. It's yeah, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that's what, you know, it feels like it's uh, just a very natural thing to do, to be asking those, mm -hmm. those questions of the modern world as you do, as you do of, the, of the world of the past. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I mean, you have to... I, know, I mean, again, sorry, I'm just thinking your thing about the writing in and out of history, that there's a brilliant um, academic at Oxford he's done this work on early Islam mm -hmm. and he says himself he wasn't really expecting to find these results and it almost wasn't what he felt he should find but in the early years of Islam a sort of a particularly the first 150 years he has 8,000 named women who are teaching and preaching in communities and in mosques mm -hmm. and there's no evidence for segregation mm. in mosques as well and isn't that interesting that that's again that's yeah. not a story that we hear yeah, about absolutely. as being something which is kind of foundational at that early moment of islam but it yeah. seems to be the truth yeah, <laughs> you know the, 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 the fact of what's yeah. happening so and i think that that points to something which is really important which is how often the writing out of women is a if not an intentional act part of a strategic shift of some mm. sort mm. or, you know, a, a significant political change or mm. something like that. You know, at some point somebody decided that there needed to be segregation of the sexes and yes. I'm sure there was a reason and at some point, you know, the degree of observ observable piety of the women in your family became evidence for your sort of, yeah. you know, virtuous standing in your community. Yes, um, yes. And so finding evidence that it wasn't always like that, I think, highlights the degree to which that kind of thing is constructed and not mm. just inherent to yes. a religion or a culture or something like that. Yes. Um, so I want to go back to your stonemasons because I'm fascinated I, yeah, by this. Yes. Um, one thing that I always find drives me a little bit nuts is how often stories about women, particularly stories about women who have been um, you know, hurt in conflict or very poor, some you know, people who are very vulnerable, often end up slotted into very specific gender narratives. And even when they are um, working on some sort of development scheme, they're weaving baskets or mm. sewing clothes mm. or doing things that mm. are maybe not even typical female occupations in those societies, but are typical female occupations in the societies of donors yes. who are paying for that. So interesting, yeah. So where did these stonemasons come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who did this and yeah. how? <laughs> yeah. It's a really, it's, it's a, it's, it is it is indeed intriguing. And they, um, you know, these women, they, uh, they say, I don't know if I said this before, but they say as they work in the stone, I know I'm now as strong as any man. Mm -hmm. I, for the first time in my life, I feel like I can do what any man can do. Um, so it's uh, it was this is actually a scheme that's supported by the Cultural Protection Fund, mm -hmm. and it came about as a result of Palmyra. Um, so there was some money put aside, just with this notion that cultural heritage matters, which is a very very kind of simple idea. So it mm -hmm. actually comes from the art mm -hmm. rather than from the notion of um, needing to enact projects. Mm -hmm. And then and then there was a kind of working out of how this should how this should happen. And and that region, as you know, so this is in North, North Jordan, in Mafrak, very close to the border. Um, the, the stonework there is incredible. So you have beautiful cities like Amman and mm -hmm. Jerash, and then further south, Petra, and then obviously Damascus and Aleppo. So stoneworking is a central part of the essence of what it is to live in that region and there is beautiful stone to work from mm -hmm. so I think it felt like something which was very uh, totally appropriate to the region and um, a notion that if you use your hands it is therapeutic we know mm -hmm. that using your hands creates new neural pathways um, it means that you can both transcend your current uh, 
uh, location and circumstances and also find transcend what you are capable of within mm-hmm. within yourself and i they there are as you know there are a lot of women that have come across those borders by yeah. by themselves mm-hmm. and and they have no way of supporting themselves Mm -hmm. so it was a scheme that was just then allowed to be opened to women as well as men very cleverly the school is opposite the UNCHR uh, one of the points where refugees queued to be registered Mm -hmm. so they just you could hear the kind of chipping Mm -hmm. of chipping of the stone Um, and it's it's a beautiful it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced actually Mm -hmm. and to see the hope and determination of those women to become good at what they do so that they can go back and rebuild their their homeland Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. Yeah, it is. It is.